This podcast is brought to you by the Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation. Are you looking to support your memory and optimize your quality of life? Develop a healthy brain for brighter days at PNI's Lifestyle Program, available virtually and in person. Reserve your spot today. Visit PacificLifestyle.org to learn more. everyone, and welcome to Your Healthy Dose. This is a podcast about current trends in healthcare, and I'm your host, Kim Douglas. There's a lot of buzz surrounding our topic today, psilocybin, or better known as magic mushrooms. So what does an illegal drug have to do with healthcare? Well, we will find out right now. With me today is Dr. Daniel Kelly, and Dr. Keith Heiserling from the Pacific Trip Program here at St. John's. They will get us up to speed on what could be a game changer for mental health. So Dr. Kelly is the director and one of the founders of Pacific Neuroscience Institute, and Dr. Heiserling is director of Pacific Treatment and Research in Psychedelics Program at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Does that sound about right, guys? Yes. yes. Good. Well, welcome to both of you, and thank you for being here. I will tell you this. Um, out of all the podcasts that we've done, this one, pun intended, has received the most buzz. Um, I'm sure you guys get all kinds of those bad jokes, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, let's dive right in, because this is really an interesting topic. And what is the TRIP program? So the TRIP program was created really in collaboration with Keith and I back about three years ago, started thinking about it four years ago. We, we created a, a brain health center of excellence within Pacific Neuroscience Institute. We have nine centers of excellence, and it was actually the last one that we created focused on mental health issues um, such as dementia, memory issues, anxiety, depression, And there was a lot of buzz going on about psychedelics back then, uh, and we started looking into this, and uh, we were able to recruit Dr. Heinzerling from UCLA, and um, we formed the Treatment and Research in Psychedelics program back in in mid-2019 to really have a a platform to to dive into the world of psychedelic-assisted therapy and psychedelic science given that there's so much potential in the mental health realm for use of these compounds, which are now mostly um, not available to clinicians. Right, right. So what psychedelic drugs are you currently testing in the trials right now? I'll let Dr. Heinzerling answer that question. We focused initially on psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. For the clinical trials, we usually are working with a pharmaceutical company that's hoping to uh, develop data to potentially get FDA approval to use the drug to treat a condition. And so they have uh, developed, uh, it's actually synthetic, the drug instead of giving a patient mushrooms to eat uh, or extracting the medicine from the mushrooms, they are actually synthesizing the psilocybin. So it's a capsule, pure psilocybin, 25 milligrams that we use for the clinical trials. And so that's, so my question was, can you talk about each drug and what benefit they hope to serve? So is that basically the only drug you're dealing with or are there others? No, there are others. Um, Psilocybin is an attractive one and many of us have focused on it because It comes from nature. It's been around forever. Humans have been ingesting mushrooms. So from a safety perspective, probably if there was something, you know, big toxicity, someone would have figured it out. Right. Um, But the other medications that there's the big medicines that have potential or are being used for psychedelic therapy at the moment, in addition to psilocybin, would be MDMA, which is uh, when it's used on the street, is called ecstasy, which is very close to FDA approval for PTSD. LSD, which is undergoing 
trials for anxiety disorders and will be working, participating as a site in a trial upcoming for that. And then, although it's not, we're not doing as much research, but ketamine, which is an anesthetic, actually has some psychedelic properties. It's a clinically available medicine. So we, we have a very active and growing treatment program, which uses a psychedelic approach to treating depression, anxiety, uh, selected alcohol problems using ketamine as the psychedelic drug. So where do we stand in these trials? So uh, right now, as Keith mentioned, MDMA has is by far the farthest along. They've completed this organization called MAPS has completed a phase three trial, which had hugely positive results with uh, re- resolution of PTSD. They're in They've just completed enrollment for their second phase three trial, which is required by the FDA. And it's anticipated that FDA approval will likely come sometime in 2024, so fairly soon. With psilocybin, um, most of the trials, the trials that we were involved in uh, center around depression. Um, but it's being tried in many other things, such as um, anxiety and other, other disorders. But um, possible FDA approval for psilocybin Provided the phase two trials are positive, there'll be phase three trials, and then um, hopefully FDA approval. So that's probably three or four years away. Um, LSD is much further off because there really haven't been any significant number of phase two trials yet. It's possible that that would be coming. So the the big two right now really that could come out and be clinically available to, to clinicians would be MDMA in 2024 and then psilocybin hopefully a few years after that. Oh, that's encouraging. So how does psychedelics work versus current like psychotherapy with antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications? It's a very different approach. um, And it's very refreshing, actually, as a clinician, because it's very oriented to empowering the patient couple differences from our standard approaches are that for psychedelic therapy, typically we're giving one or a few doses of the medicine under clinical supervision at the clinic in our case. So there's a doctor and a therapist present. um, And they don't go home with the medicine. They don't take medicines chronically. Some antidepressants, you might have to take them every day for life. And actually, they can be very helpful to patients. They're not, not you know, they, there certainly are, are patients who benefit. But it's nice to not have someone chronically on the medication. Absolutely. Could this also help cancer patients? Absolutely. And, and a number of the initial trials, um, some of the phase two trials in psilocybin were specifically on patients with, with um, life-threatening cancer and showed... Um, really positive results in terms of relieving their anxiety, their existential crisis, their depression, getting them more comfortable with the process and the reality of dying. So we think that's a big area where um, psychedelics um, can help. Like even with chemotherapy, just going into that? Well, maybe the, yeah, the whole, the whole um, sort of process of people going through a cancer diagnosis and, and multiple treatments yeah, absolutely. So can you both talk about the process to get FDA approval and the steps that you have to take to maintain that legality? Or did you already hit on that regarding the... No, we, we could say more. Um, so again, um, most of the interesting drugs or medicines, psilocybin, MDMA, the federal government still lists them as what we call Schedule I controlled substances, they, which means that they're considered by the government to have no legitimate medical use. They're just dangerous narcotics. Um, and uh, the, uh, so as we're doing the research studies, if it's proven that there's a medical benefit, that the medicines can be used to help people to treat a condition or relieve suffering, then that status will have to change because by definition then there will be a legitimate legitimate medical use. There are a lot of medications that are legal for doctors to prescribe and patients to take that 
that do have risks, right? So it it's not that it's not the difference between complete free reign use of the drugs for you know with no restrictions versus zero. There likely will be some restrictions still on the medications because they're quite powerful. Um, but this restriction of Schedule One means that th there is a huge amount of paperwork and time and energy that has to be um, devoted to get approval from the federal government, even to be able to do legitimate research. It's very costly and time consuming, slows down the process. And we have, and, and it's for good reason. And, and the government has been cooperating and working with us. We actually have, are lucky to have a very good partnership with the FDA and the DEA. One other quick thing that Dr. Kelly mentioned that psilocybin, one of the earlier research studies, was in patients who were facing terminal illnesses and death and dying. And I think that's a really good example of how the potential and the approach that we use in psychedelic therapy, particularly for things like depression or anxiety or alcoholism, it's the treatments that we have now, mostly they're oriented towards reducing symptoms. Like if you're depressed, antidepressants may make you a bit less sad or less depressed. Whereas psychedelic therapy, it seems to go more at like the core of who we are and where we are in the universe and as a person and our connections. It's, it's a really deep and sometimes very transformative process. And so it's not necessarily targeting a specific symptom, but maybe helping the person get to a place where they're stronger or better equipped to you know, sometimes, unfortunately, live with a problem that might not go away, that yeah. there isn't a cure for, um, as opposed to just giving, here's a pill and maybe you'll feel a little less bad. This is a process where you might end up feeling better. Right. Not just a Band-Aid. Yeah, I may just add a yeah. little to what Please. Keith said. You know, I think when you think about antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs, anxiolytics, um, it is more of sort of a suppressive approach. And this is really a more expansive psycho-spiritual approach. It's really diving in deep. And one of, the, one of the processes that we think the way psychedelics work, it allows these different parts, these different neural networks to communicate with each other that don't normally communicate because of the ego. Um, some some people refer to the default mode network, which is really this this group of connections in our brain that is that is the way we think about ourselves and others, and we have worries about the future and regrets about the past. And and psilocybin, particularly LSD, it's thought that they dampen the default mode network, allow all these different areas to communicate with one another, and allow people to have some epiphanies about themselves. And it can be, as Keith said, transformative. And, um, and in fact, the degree of transformation or the, the, the um, intensity of the so-called mystical experience is one of the measures of efficacy that we look at in the clinical trials. And it tends to correlate that the stronger the chances of a mystical experience, the more likely that you'll have a therapeutic benefit from, from the experience. And so... Um, and I think that's one of the things from a neuroscience standpoint, which is, is what excites Keith and I so much about this, this work, because it's so profound and so different. Um, and we think of it, you know, me being a surgeon, we think of it in, in a way as sort of like a procedure. This is a much different than taking a pill every day. And the success of the procedure is really dependent upon, you know, is it really indicated for the patient's? Uh, do you have the appropriate team? Has the patient gone through the appropriate preparation during the journey itself? Do you have the appropriate, you know, safety measures in place to help the the individual deal with some of the rough waters they may encounter in their in their in their trip? And then what's at the end on the other side is called the integration, where where the individual will then process what they've been through, and um, that is a lot of can be a lot of hard work. And can take weeks and months, but but that is um, taking the knowledge that was sort of given to them by the medicine during the experience, 
and then integrating that into their lives. And so it's a it's a much different process. And I think it's why we call it psychedelic assisted therapy, because it's not just giving someone 25 milligrams of psilocybin and, and say, good luck. There's a lot of prep and a lot of integration on, on either side and, of course, support during the, during the journey. Yeah. How do you actually prepare your patient for the psychedelics? And just talk about the different sessions from prep to integration. Keith, you want to take that? Sure. You're, you're doing... Yeah, of course. Um, the uh, You mentioned the model is preparatory counseling and then a treatment session involving the medicine and then after that follow-up counseling sessions, which we call integration counseling. And then you may or may not repeat that process depending on which medicine and which condition. But the preparation involves um, establishing some rapport with the, with the clinical team so that the patient feels comfortable and we know each other. Uh, getting some important, um, you know, background clinically and psychologically. That way we can have an idea, well, maybe there might be some rough spots that we should be aware of. Um, and also just strictly medically, some people, maybe their blood pressure might tend a little higher. We take some precautions just to protect them physically. And then um, in the preparation, a big part is that we ask the patients to set an intention for their treatment or their experience or their journey, as some people call it. Um, and I think journey is a very appropriate term, actually, because uh, although it's usually used to, to for the trip, the, the actual drug session, what we find is that, you know, people are coming to us seeking something in the first place. They are often treatment-resistant depression or they've had relapsing alcoholism or whatnot. And so... You know, their journey began when they started looking for something different that might work. And when they first met with us, and then this is these are different chapters in the journey as they go through the the other sessions. So for our audience, describe for them and myself, uh, what does a person experience when they're going through a trip? what What could I expect? The uh, the, the length of the experience uh, depends on which medicine because the drugs last for different. So that's one thing to consider. But generally speaking, um, uh, patients arrive in ahead of time. We like to give them a little time. If you think about it, if you're on like the 405 freeway, right? I mean, you got to kind <laughs> of decompress yeah. a little bit. That's a trip in itself, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly, <laughs> right. So. We have them get there early and we've got a whole process set up to to welcome them and really have like a little buffer time. Nice. Decompress There's, kind exactly. of. Exactly. The rooms, the treatment rooms are set up kind of like a little living room. They're not like a clinic at all. There's a couch. They're furnished nicely. Usually at, um, we have the curtains drawn and the lights down and some relaxing music on. Um, they recline on the couch. We give them blankets. Um, the therapist comes in and goes over the plan for the day and really starts to talk with them about their intention. A lot of times we'll do like a brief meditation session or some relaxation breathing. We really want them to be, to drop into that place in their mind where the thinking, calculating part of the mind or any of the apprehension starts to go away so that they can just get, lean back and, and settle back into the the flow of the medicine as it begins. And then we would administer the medicine, psilocybin, they would swallow a capsule, LSD, they'll swallow a capsule, um, ketamine, we give them an injection intramuscularly in the arm. And then they put eye shades on to filter, and we turn the music up a little bit, which is to filter out the, the stimuli from outside and create like a little cocoon so that they can focus internally on the experience, and then we monitor them while it unfolds. Okay, so can a person die from using psychedelics? And is this treatment safe for everyone? And what about safety in general? Great question. So there is no what they call the LD50 for psilocybin or LSD, the lethal dose. Um, the, the, the classic psychedelics psilocybin and LSD are considered physiologically very safe. Now, can someone think they can fly and um, 
jump off a building or walk into traffic. Of course they can, and those sorts of things have happened in the past probably, um, back in back in the day. Um, the way things are going now with the clinical trials, the safety of these compounds has been proven over and over again. The, the number of serious adverse events is what is a, a, a term used are extremely rare in these with these medications. MDMA can raise the blood pressure a little bit, um, but in general, they're considered very physiologically safe. One of the interesting things you ask, can you die? Well, often people will say, I think I'm dying. Yeah. And um, we do, one of the mantras that is used to help people gain fortitude and sort of accept the process is trust, let go, and be open. And so if you think you're going to die, um, you say, it's okay, you can you can go. You're not going to die. Or if, they, if they're walking down and they see a very dark stairwell and at the bottom there's a door, go down, open the door and go into it. And this is where people often, they will get stuck sometimes. And this is the importance of experienced guides to be with the patient, to sometimes hold their hand, to encourage them, say, it's okay, we're here with you. You're not dying, but go go with the flow. Let it happen and let it take you. And, and that's when a lot of people seem to have these these breakthroughs. Um, and I think so, um, can you die? Um, in the in the current clinical trials, it's that's not an issue. And I think that that the the volume of of safety data is is being shown, you know, over and over again. And so, but again, in a very controlled setting, the preparation is essential. An experienced team, again, just like a surgical procedure, that is so essential to the success and safety of this um, this sort of new approach to mental health care. We've had multiple patients experience what Dr. Kelly was describing as ego death is one of the terms that researchers use or to describe the process where people feel like they have died. Um, but that's my job, right? I'm, I'm there. We'll be sitting there in the room monitoring the person's blood pressure vitals, they're just silent. You should monitor my fine. blood pressure right now. I'm like, oh my gosh. That's Whatever intense. they're, we're, we're, you know, they are experiencing something somewhere in an element of consciousness, perhaps. I mean, I, we're trained in science, so I don't know the scientific answers for this. But what I do know is that people's mind allows them to go to another place and experience something, whether it's real, imagined, uh, whether this is Maybe it's more real than this for all I know. I don't know. But what I do know is, you know, I tell them, listen, wherever you go, it's kind of like a kite. We've got you on the string, We're, but let that string go out and let it get up in the wind and let it fly. I'm going to be here. Your body is going to be here. Your physical self is going to be on this couch. If there's anything going wrong physiologically, I'm going to intervene to address it. We're doctors, right? We'll do whatever yeah. is is necessary. But there's really not, you know, you, you won't even know. Like, you'll, they'll be there quiet. They'll come wake back up and say, I experienced death and rebirth. And you're like, well, we were just sitting here, you know, <laughs> doing nothing, waiting for it to be over, counting your pulse, you know. Wow. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. Okay, so tell me this. What is either one of you, your most memorable, obviously you won't say names or anything, but that you encountered? Was there somebody that did try to get up and walk out to a building? Or I mean, obviously they wouldn't, but was there some unique experience that well, you... Just quickly about this the physical safety i mean we do take that seriously we have a lot of precautions in the clinic um, we take people's phone and their keys and their shoes i mean you know they're just gonna it's like you're almost like you're checking into a spa you're gonna be like wearing slippers anyway right so but we we do like that that's the case and and we have precautions so that people it, it's, it's not easy for people to leave but honestly you know if you take a drug the psychedelic medicines drugs they don't produce specific effects as much as they amplify whatever's going on or open, take the, the governor or the, or the filter off the subconscious. So 
if you're at a rock concert or you're in an uncontrolled environment and you take the drug, there'll be chaos. Right. But these people, they know they're coming to a clinic with an intention of exploring themselves, learning about themselves, finding healing and compassion and love. And so most of the time, you know, it goes down that path. Um, yeah. So, you know, I just don't, you're just off in a whole different landscape. I, I don't know, you know, how our, our setting, the, the setting that we've set up, the environment is Aww. already sets the mental and spiritual stage for them to not freak out. So, you know. And I think um, that the other term that's used is set and setting. And set is really the mindset of the individual, which we try to optimize. And the setting is the clinic space to try and make it warm comfortable, non-threatening, um, and getting to know the, the people who are going to be accompanying you on your, on your journey. And the, you know, the, there, there is measures of the mystical experience. There's a mystical experience scale and, you know, things like a sense of unity with the universe, transcendence of time and space, there's a, a sort of a noetic or a knowing that whatever you, you, you may not be able to explain it. And this is one of the things they say, it's ineffable, that the experience is very hard to describe, but you know, whatever you're experiencing is, is real, um, very positive feeling, spiritual. Um, those are kind of the recurring themes of people that are having these really um, positive experiences, which seem to, again, correlate with, with um, success of the, of the experience. And I have to say, on a personal note, when you were talking about safety and the setting, you two are not at all frenetic or chaotic. You you both have a very calming personality, too. So I'm sure that aids the patient in just that safety net, if you will. So the, that's really the great. Therapists are even better. Than, oh, really? Than they're, wow. they're the pros at that. And um, sets the tone. Yeah. And, you know, and they just, having the patient, the pa person has to trust the team, right? the place, mm -hmm. you know, they're very vulnerable. They're going to voluntarily put themselves in a very vulnerable position. Kind of like if you're the patient going into surgery, right? You want to trust that, you, you know, you're going to be out of it. You get, someone's going to have to look after you. This is more active. It's actually you doing the experience, but still, um, you know, anything could come up in their mind. They may talk about things that are very personal, they have to really trust you. And that's our goal, to create an environment where they know they're safe, where we have very, we have um, rules and precautions that, so they know that we talk ahead of time, that uh, if they do feel like they need a little support, they could reach out and ask for us to maybe hold their hand. But we have rules about where not to touch, and we go over with people, whether they don't feel if they don't feel comfortable with any physical touch, which is really important to respect their their safety and their boundaries, um, because they're going to have to let go. And you know, it's kind of like if you were gonna. People are good good at acting or performing. They have to just go out on stage and just let it go and not be afraid of thinking about like you know, maybe people are thinking this is weird or what if it's not funny or right. I mean. So they just, they're, they're doing their performance. They need to be able to not have distractions and feel completely safe to just go out there and go for it. Aaron. I, I would just add that, um, you know, the experience can be very hard for people sometimes. And there's so oftentimes a lot of tears are shed and um, very deep, you know, heartfelt emotions. And that, that's all okay. Um, in a number of the studies over the years, when they have asked, individuals, you know, how does this experience rate with your other life experiences? And in many of the studies, um, two-thirds of the patient will say it's in the top five experiences of my life. And uh, many of them will say it's the, it's in the top five most spiritual experiences of my, of my life. So it's a, it's a profound process. And this um, trust and safety of the, of the team and the sort of cocoon is, is essential. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how many trips does it usually take for a patient to see results? And does this change them forever or is it just a temporary change? 
It depends on the medication. Right. But let's talk about psilocybin as a good example. Um, the way that the studies are being done are actually determined a lot more based on the type of data you'd want to generate for the FDA than what I might do if the medicine was approved and we had free reign. Um, so the studies have used one experience, one trip, or sometimes two within like separated by a couple of weeks or a month. But honestly, that's mostly because what you're just throwing, you know, we're, we're, it's an experiment. It's artificial. We want to get, say, 100 people, 50 have the real psilocybin, 50 have a placebo, which is another, you know, crazy thing about the, the studies. Some people are going to come in, spend all day, and maybe not actually get the psilocybin. Um, and then just see what happens and give it to the FDA, hoping to move forward. But again, I think the key thing is this the idea that it's a journey or a process, um, that's also in the MDMA research. Their approach has taken this approach as well, that um, it's going to be different for different patients. And, you know, it's it's going to be determined by the person and how much the person has in them to get done. And, you know, when, so we did a study that we sponsored, which was, funded in large part by the Annenberg Foundation through incredible generosity and also quite a few individual donors who we we're blessed to have. Um, we did a, a study with psilocybin and patients with alcohol use disorder. And there were 20 patients in the study. There was no placebo. So each of the patients, we knew they were getting psilocybin. And each patient was supposed to do two trips separated by a month we were very lucky. We actually did 39 out of the 40 trips. Only one patient didn't do the second session because he had to be um, admitted to a rehab because the drinking was was rough. But, um, you know, what you see in the first one is that you prepare the people, you tell them what it's going to be like, but they come out of it and they go, oh, now I know what you're trying to <laughs> When's the next one? Because I see now. Now uh, I, I heard what you said, but... Now I understand. And then the second one, they'll pick up where they left off. And some people, you know, people would say to us, you know, did I do, how did I do? Did I do enough? Did, did I do the right thing? And, and you're like, no, you, you did amazing. And you did exactly what you needed to do for now. And everyone's doing exactly as much as they can do in the day. And some people tolerate a lot and other people less. And it's that's it's life more than treatment. It's really like it's it's really more like just what it is to be alive day to day and try to be present and do your best and learn and not screw up, you know. Exactly. Words of wisdom. Well, I might just add because you you were getting into this question of how many trips and yeah. does it take and does it last? And so this the durability question is really an interesting one. The, is is it a durable treatment? Meaning, does it last? So, as Keith said, for psilocybin, it's usually one or two trips. For MDMA, the, their protocol is three trips separated by a few weeks by each one, and they're seeing you know seventy to eighty percent resolution of PTSD in those patients, at least in their initial studies. So. Um, one of the questions, again, going back to the neuroscience of how this works, is that there's good data now that these are all of these um, medicines are what we call neuroplastogens, meaning they they somehow promote neuroplasticity. So they they allow the brain to actually rewire. So even though you have this tremendous psychedelic experience for four to six hours, there's something that goes on with these molecules when they're in their brain, in your brain, that allows the brain to somehow rewire to, to um, augment some some lasting change. And it's a it's an ongoing, very hot debate in the neurosciences and the in the psychedelic sciences now. And we don't really know the answers, but there there does seem to be something there. And hopefully, what this is one of the things that Keith and I and the team will be looking at over the years of. How do, how do psychedelics work? How are they so fundamentally different from our other approaches to mental health care? And, and again, it goes back to this, that the brain, even though as we age, we get more and more sort of restricted and we get in, stuck in our sort of ego or default mode, 
there are ways to to break out of that and to and to break bad habits and and harmful ways of thinking about yourself and others and um, so this this durability question is is really out there and, and a exciting area for for future studies. And you kind of lead me right into my next question, which is, what is your vision for the trip program in the next five years? Go ahead, Keith. Yeah. Oh well, vision is we have no shortage of yeah. vision. <laughs> it's really just a question of time and space and resources. So, um, but I mean, every day we're. I feel so lucky just to be able to do this. And uh, you know, Dr. Kelly, uh, he had a vision and, you know, I remember saying like, well, of course I want to like do psychedelics, but like, you know, we didn't talk about, but the federal government doesn't really pay for research with psychedelics. They're kind of thinking about it now. But so I said to him, I was like, well, yeah, I mean, of course, everyone wants to do this. Everybody at UCLA wants to do it, but where are you going to get the money? Where are you going to get the support? People are going to be like, you're crazy, right? But no, he, he managed to get it going. And so, you know, every day I think, wow, it's just incredible that we have this opportunity. It is a gift. And it's a gift also. This is really novel and new and exciting in the scientific world. But, you know, indigenous peoples were the ones who figured out that these plants created experiences for people and that they could be used by people in communities or healers or shamans to try to help people better themselves and help people, you know, be, get better connected with the planet and nature and their communities to try to live more in harmony. And we really are standing on their shoulders. And um, they considered this, it was, these are sacred activities, the, the plants, the medicines, the ceremonies, they, they were sacred and they are sacred to these people. And so we have to approach this with a lot of gratitude and and a lot of respect for that. Um, so uh, you know we're in this for the long run. I think this is a fat. It's I mean there is a fat aspect of it. It's a hot topic. A lot of people want to like jump on and make a maybe make a quick buck on some investments, but that's not we we've been doing treating patients for you know coming on twenty years, and we we're interested in this because we think that it's one of the best ways to help people in the long run. Yeah, I, I just to add on to what Keith said, this this shamanic model, the paradigm, is really how the set and setting concept came about. And this goes back hundreds and really thousands of years. And so I think it is important to be respectful, respectful of that um, and incorporate that. And I think one of the things that a lot of people, um, since it it the psychedelic research was so big in the 50s and 60s, and it was really almost mainstream psychiatry, and then it went off the rails, and then we have this thing called the Controlled Substances Act, which which put all of these drugs into Schedule One in 1970, and psychedelic research just went into the deep freeze for about 20 years, and so it's gradually picking up now. But one of the things that I think is a little concerning is there are literally hundreds of psychedelic startups now, and trying to tweak the molecules, um, tweak the process. Some some are trying to take the psychedelic experience out of it. They think maybe that's not necessary, and it may not be, but we don't know. But there is this sort of concern of of almost the, the big pharma concept getting in and and really turning it into sort of a, you know, a, the corporatization of this process because, um, I mean, there is an element of that that a lot of people are watching carefully. And certainly, um, as Keith said, the the FDA and the DEA, you know, are looking very carefully. There's not a lot of NIH funding for this now, and so there is a need for philanthropy and you know corporate sponsorship to some degree. So we'll see how it plays out. But I think our trip program is really aimed at um, working with all the different molecules um, as they are available working safely with them, helping to answer some of these interesting scientific questions and, and to um, help expand the availabil- availability of these medicines for, for people in, in need. Bring right. it into the mainstream healthcare when, system. When, when well, do you think that will be? Well, available? actually, you know, we haven't talked too much about ketamine and it's a complicated topic and it's not 
precisely the same as psilocybin or LSD or MDMA, but we have an active treatment program with regular patients right now. Unfortunately, not all of it is covered by insurance, which is an issue. So there is a cost out of pocket for some of it for patients. But we treat patients every day using this psychedelic approach with ketamine as the drug. And as soon, you know, and what what that's doing is giving us the experience and providence in the hospital and the health system, the experience of the model. And once MDMA and psilocybin and the others, if they become approved and insurance companies start covering it, we're ready to go, hopefully. Yeah, you're off and running. I might just say one thing about funding, um, just so people understand how expensive it is to do these trials. So um, as Keith said, we are very fortunate to get funding from the Annenberg Foundation, and then a number of other individuals have supported us um, to the tune of a little over $3 million in total. And we've been very, very fortunate in that respect to, it's given us some runway to get a lot accomplished to complete two clinical trials, to have some others in, in the works. Um, but if you if you just break it down per patient, um, per subject in a trial, it's around thirty to $40,000 per individual to run through the entire trial for all the things that are required to do. So, you know, if you have a 20-person trial, it's six six hundred or $800,000. So that just gives you a, a little bit of um, ballpark measure of how expensive it is. So the success of this program has really been dependent upon the generosity of not only the Annenberg Foundation and a lot of individual donors, but also the St. John's Health Center Foundation and Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation. So with without those entities and these people, we, we wouldn't be here. Absolutely. Well, just talking about you two, how did you, before we wrap up, how did the two of you get together and how did you two get into this field? I know you were supposed to be a rock star, so that's a whole other <laughs> podcast interview. I was just cruising along, having a great time with a wonderful, supportive environment at UCLA. My objective was always to be an academic physician and to do research. And I worked in a very awesome research group doing clinical trials of treatments for addiction at UCLA. But we were always interested in psychedelics because when you when people get are able to change whether they're addicted to drugs or alcohol, you often see they have this epiphany. Sometimes it's AA, sometimes it's meditation, sometimes it just happens. And we always thought, how could we trigger that? And it seemed like psychedelics would be a way to do it. But like I said, I could not figure out how to get it done or funded at UCLA. And Dr. Kelly had recruited several docs who I knew to start the brain health program, Dr. Porter, Dr. Merrill. I just was friends with them from UCLA. And they said, you should just come over and meet Dan one day, you know, and I just came over. Just I had not much agenda, to be honest. And he said, what I want to do is start a psychedelics clinical trial unit. And I was like, well, yeah, that, like I said, yeah, let's do that. But where are you <laughs> going to get the money? The government won't fund it. And he said, give me a one pager. I wrote a couple one pagers that I thought, no, is he serious about this? Maybe I should be a little cautious. And then I said, forget it. I'm just going to put like crazy stuff down there. And he was like, this is perfect. Let's do it. And that was it. Honestly, we you, went from there. Yep. And can you write a one pager for me? And then Dan, can you go take it somewhere? <laughs> is that how it truly it started for you? Yeah, that's how it started. I he guess was active and thinking about it for a long time before we bumped into each other. I, you know, I think a lot of us had been thinking about it for a long time. Um, you know, me, like many Americans, you know, it's estimated that 30 to 40 million Americans have had a psychedelic experience. So it's a pretty large chunk of society. And many of us had psychedelic experiences back in our college days um, a long time ago. And for some, it never left us. It was profound at the time, even though it would be considered, quote, recreational drug use. Um, but I think in some ways it, it, it got me interested in the neurosciences and ultimately doing what I do as a neuroscientist and a neurosurgeon. And uh, so when I started hearing about this um, in the news and on podcasts, and I read Michael Pollan's book, 
I thought, well, that we we have to do this. This is this has come back, and we need to explore this. And fortunately, I was led to Keith, and um, Keith had a similar passion. And uh, you know, the re- the rest is is history. So we we've had a really good run over the last three years, three and a half years now, and uh, we're still just kind of getting started. But it's a pretty pretty exciting time in the neurosciences and with our program. It sounds like it. It's fun to, people say, what do you do? And yeah. Just, you know, I give psychedelic drugs to people, yeah. you know, you dose you guys, people with drugs. Yeah, you guys are really popular. It's their job. Cocktail paid parties. to do it. Exactly. Well, to close the show, how about if you both just give us a couple of sentences or two of what you feel would be the most important takeaway for our listeners and our audience? I would say that it's important for people to understand that uh, psychedelic-assisted therapy is a potential game-changer for mental health care. There's a lot of hype about it, but there's a lot of good science being done. And uh, I'm confident, I think Keith's confident, that you know, in the next five to ten years, it's going to transform behavioral health care. Exactly. And just building on that, What I try to say to patients who are thinking about this is I have incredible optimism and enthusiasm. I agree with what Dr. Kelly said. I think it's got the potential to be a game changer, but it's not. Some people want a magic bullet still, and I just don't see it working that way. It is, it's not an easy process for a lot of people. It takes a lot of work from the patient, a lot of time, Um, and really the the, it doesn't end. Like the patients in the alcohol study that we did, we were, and when that was our first psilocybin study, we were all so focused on getting them to that first trip, the first dosing session. They, they had like two weeks, of, they had to go through all kinds of screening and then two weeks of counseling. And then boom, we get to that first one. And from the research perspective, at some level, that was kind of like the end. We were like, okay, we got them there. But for them, categorically, universally, most of them felt like, whoa, this is the start. Yeah, I was so focused on getting to this session, but this is just the beginning. It has opened up all these opportunities, but also challenges. And, Mm -hmm. you know, coming back from there and back to this world and then figuring out how do you not lose it? So it wasn't just like a vacation or a quick, like, you know, trip to Hawaii and then you come back and you're back to the grind. And how do you integrate that into your day-to-day life to make your life and the life of the people and creatures and the planet better, that's really the the key. And that's a lifelong process um, that you might need to commit to if you're going to do this. Right. Well, as you said, it's just the beginning. Unfortunately for us, it's the end. But thank you both. We are out of time. And thank you both for being here Dr. Kelly, Dr. Heiserling, it really was very, very informative. And I thank you both for being here. And thank you to St. John's Health Center Foundation for making this podcast possible. And thank you, all of you, for joining us today. And please send us your health questions, and you can send them to your healthy dose podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Kim Douglas with your healthy dose.